Hello and welcome to Stand in the Gap. I'm Sam Rohr and I'll be joined again by Isaac Crockett. Last week on this program, we introduced part one of our special emphasis on the rise of socialism in America. We entitled the program, that one and this one, Dethroning God in America, How It's Being Done. Now, in last week's program, Isaac and I noted the dramatic increase of millennial and younger people, Generation Z in particular, indicating that they are favoring socialism by numbers in some polls approaching almost 60%. We also noted that according to George Barna Worldview Research that the percentage of millennials and Generation Z who hold to a biblical worldview position of God, creation, sin, and redemption has plummeted to between 2 and 3 percent. Now, putting these two factors together helps us to understand the popularity of elected officials and candidates for office who openly, now, and aggressively promise what socialism always promises, but can never deliver. But putting these facts together also raises the very real question of how freedom in America, our Constitution, and our ability to live freely as Christians in our nation, how can this continue in light of this tremendous rise of atheistic and anti-God socialism? Now, helping us to understand how God is being dethroned in America is researcher, author, and radio and TV host Brandon Howes of WorldviewWeekend.com, who shared that it was a group of people called the Frankfurt School, who came to America in 1933 on invitation from John Dewey. Their request? To target education and the media. Education and the media. Attack the existing morality of the culture. Change the values of society until the society willingly and openly embraced the tenets of socialism, which was the economic philosophy of Karl Marx. The goal was to get America to embrace cultural socialism. Now, last week we identified four thought leaders who provided key core thoughts which together have formed the strategy to dethrone God in America and to train up a generation who are now not looking to God, but looking to the God of government. These four men are Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud, Friedrich Nietzsche, and George Hegel. Last week we looked at the first two. The first was Karl Marx and the second was Sigmund Freud. To give us a, just a quick overview before we get into Nietzsche and Hegel on today's program will be ha uh, Brandon Howes. And uh, thanks for being with us again today, Brandon. Thank you for having me, Sam. Brandon, just in a quick effort to do a quick review of last week. Take about a minute, a minute and a half if you would. Give us an overview of Karl Marx uh, his thought contribution to this embracing of socialism, targeting America, and, uh, and what he was known for, if you could. Yes. Well, Karl Marx, I think he sums it up in one sentence. He said, my object in life is to dethrone God and destroy capitalism. Dethrone God and destroy capitalism. So by that, he meant the need to destroy Christianity and destroy God in the hearts and the minds or the conscience of the people. And he also understood that really from a biblical worldview, you have the idea of private property, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet. You have also have the issue of the family. And many people forget that in the 10 planks of the Communist Manifesto, one of them is women would be communal wives, communal wives. So we see a disrespecting of the tradition uh, and the biblical framework for marriage. So again, Karl Marx openly stated, my object in life is to dethrone God, destroy capitalism. And that's what we're doing today, because if there is no God, then that means the state is God. And therefore, the state can give and the state can take it away. And that's what you're seeing today. That definitely has affected our culture. So now let's move on to Sigmund Freud. Uh, we think of him with modern psychology and such. What, what role did he play? What were his goals and what kind of uh, thought contributions did he uh, put to this kind of this game that's being played uh, to help us move towards this acceptance of socialism? Well, like Karl Marx, Sigmund Freud also hated Christians. Uh, Marx made no secret about his hatred of God and Christianity, although he had not been like this at one time. He supposedly was a professing believer as a young person and then openly changed and wrote about the fact that he changed. But he went on to talk about his hatred of Christians, Marx did. So did Sigmund Freud. So they have that in common. Freud, in fact, hated Christians so much 
that he said the Christians were insane, they were neurotic, they were psychopaths. He said the truly normal and sane people were those who lived out their natural inclinations to the lust of killing, cannibalism, and incest. He said those people were the normal ones. He said the people of faith, conservatives, Christians, they had suppressed their natural inclinations to the lust of killing, cannibalism, and incest, so they had gone crazy. So the truly neurotic ones were the Christians. So again, the common theme here is set up and take down Christians and the Judeo-Christian ethic. When you do that, you can roll right into socialism, which is what the Frankfurt School wanted to do. It's very important to understand that all they were trying to do was destroy the cultural morality by destroying the worldview and then the values, the conduct would come naturally. People would openly embrace socialism. They would want it. They would beg for it. Destroy the idea of hard work, perseverance, masculinity. Then what do you have? Laziness. How are you going to survive? Socialism. So once you've destroyed those tenets, people openly want socialism. You don't have to force it on them. They beg for it. And what do we have now? People being elected to office like Cortez who are calling for 70% tax rates. Um, this is what they're begging for now. It didn't have to be forced at the end of a gun. It was done through education and media and the worldview of the Frankfurt School and their four thought leaders. Well, Brandon, thank you so much for this information. And it's, it's very helpful, very clear. And we're going to take a, sh a short break here and come back with Brandon House to learn more about this worldview, but also to look at two more leaders from the Frankfurt School that were very successful in helping undermine our culture and to help push us into the acceptance of socialism. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this brief message. Truth, flexible or permanent? The Bible, ancient history or powerfully relevant? Culture, a reflection of enlightenment or warning signs? The pastor, commentator or frontline combatant? Every day, American Pastors Network speaks to these questions where and when they matter. With hundreds of affiliate radio stations nationwide, a website and mobile app screening today's headlines through the twin lenses of the Bible and the Constitution. Educating, informing, equipping. This is the American Pastors Network. The time is now to stand in the gap for truth. Well, welcome back to Stand in the Gap uh, and our theme today, Dethroning God in America. We're talking about the rise of socialism in America. We did a quick review. We're going to move right now into the core of this program. We identified four thought leaders. We talked about Marx. We talked about Freud. We're going to talk now about Friedrich Nietzsche another one of this developing quartet of thought leaders that have been most critical in their successful uh, dethroning of God in America. And really, they've done it. That's a remarkable thing. Brandon, uh, let's go back right now. Let's talk about Frederick Nietzsche. He played a key role in this quartet. I call this this, this evil quartet we're, we're building out here. What was his contribution? What was he known for? And what should we know about his contribution to this demonic effort to really dethrone God. Well, he was one of the four thought leaders of the Frankfurt School when they came here to America in 1933 and really coined the phrase uh, political correctness and said they would have a long march through the institutions and attack the existing morality of the culture, change their worldview, change their values. You'll get them to naturally have conduct that is in align with socialism, anti-Christian bigotry. And so they looked, as we saw, to Karl Marx, who hated Christians, Sigmund Freud, who hated Christians and thought they were the neurotic, crazy ones, and now Friedrich Nietzsche. Nietzsche himself was crazy. He spent the last 11 years of his life out of his mind, but nobody wants to talk about that, right? But Nietzsche declared God is dead. He declared more than God is dead. He said, we killed God. And what he meant by that is we were killing God or had killed God in the conscience and mind of the people. And once you remove God from the conscience and mind of the people, uh, then you can take them anywhere you want to go. And we always see that in revolutions. They must remove any absolute truth so that the state becomes God or the leader or dictator becomes God. And so Nietzsche declared God is dead. We've killed him. He also proclaimed master morality and slave morality. And he said the, the uh, Christians will be great slaves because they believe in absolute truth, compassion toward the sick, the infirmed, and the handicapped. This makes them very weak. So he said the Christians will make great slaves. So you have master morality and you have 
slave morality. And he actually said we need to spiritualize cruelty, spiritualize cruelty. And he used to sign his names, for, uh, his letters, Frederick Nietzsche, the Antichrist, sometimes just the Antichrist. This was Frederick Nietzsche. And again, he claimed that Christianity was one of the most enormous and calamitous worldviews of all of world history. Brandon, what's so frightening about the teaching from the Frankfurt School is that they take everything the Bible says and they flip it upside down, uh, literally to the point that he says, I'm exactly the opposite. I am the anti uh, of Christ. It's also scary when you talked to us, you, we look at this, the context, historical context of what was going on geographically, uh, Germany, uh, time period. You're talking 1930s, 1933 is when this really comes over here. Well, we have, of course, we can't uh, you know, forget about Hitler and Nazi regimes. What is the tie-in? Is there, is there any, are these just happenstance that they happen to be from the same place around the same time? Or is there a connection, uh, especially with Nietzsche and Hitler and what the atrocities that my grandfather went through uh, at part of the Dutch underground? He just recently passed away a few weeks ago at 95 years old. And uh, he talks about the, the horrible things that happened um, uh, under the control of Nazism. Is there a tie-in with Nietzsche? Absolutely. Hitler liked to have his picture taken staring at a bust of Frederick Nietzsche. Uh, Hitler, it's reported, gave the writings of Nietzsche to the uh, Fabian or the uh, fascist dictator, socialist fascist dictator Mussolini. Uh, he promoted his writings to him. So, yes, Hitler really liked Nietzsche and disseminated his works. He liked to have his picture taken staring at a bust of Nietzsche. Nietzsche uh, had this concept of the Superman or a super being. Uh, that would go beyond good and evil. In fact, Nietzsche wrote a book called Beyond Good and Evil and said we had to get beyond it, that people who believe in absolute truth were, were crazy and nuts, and you got to get beyond that. He talked about the will to power. There is no right, there is no wrong, there's only the will to power. And so he said once we get past the idea or beyond the idea of good and evil, then we can spiritualize cruelty and have master morality and slave morality, and the only thing in life is power. doesn't matter how you get it, just get power. And the Superman understands this. The new man or the Superman, the evolved man who's evolved naturally as well as spiritually through this uh, process of their pagan ideas, then you could be a Superman. Hitler took that and combined it with that of Charles Darwin, survival of the fittest. And when you combine Nietzsche and Darwin, what you end up with, along with pagan spirituality, you end up with uh, Hitler's Holocaust, which in, was largely steeped in occultism and pagan idolatry. And uh, the slaughter of the Jews, again, fits right in with what's happening today. Portray people like the Jews who are into free market systems and say they're greedy and they're the source of all the problems and you eradicate them. Now what we're seeing is the rise of anti-Semitism once again around the world. Now 11 Jews killed in America in a synagogue last year. And so now it's the Jews and the Christians, the Judeo-Christian ethic. That's what's being set up by the Islamists and the Marxists. That's their red-green axis to destroy America from within so that America is no longer the capitalist haven, but can be destroyed. And I believe many of the globalists are using the Marxists to de-Christianize the West so they can enter into a new world system where you can't have a capitalist haven like America. So look out, the enemies will be set up as Christians and Jews, just like Hitler turned on the Jews and set them up as the problem makers. Now in, in the world in America, you will see Christians and Jews are the source of all suffering and oppression because that's what the Frankfurt School said. Christianity, capitalist Christians, people of faith is the source of all suffering and oppression. And, and Brandon, we could spend, uh, actually we may have to come back and do another program on building out some of this, but as, as I'm thinking, we're walking through this, I, I think of uh, the devil's strategies right from the point of creation, again, biblical worldview, God, God created, the fall, that's where the devil came to Eve and said, uh, has God said? And from there, you have really what's happening all of this. You question God and you make people think that maybe they know more than this God that they cannot see. And at that point, then it's all downhill from there. And that's, exact, yeah, and that's exactly what you're describing. Yeah, and you, you're right to take it back to Genesis because there, uh, Satan in the form of a serpent said to Eve, you will know what is right from wrong. You'll be like God. You'll be God. You'll know what is right from wrong, and you can have hidden knowledge. And we know that Hitler was involved in the occult. That's a matter of historical fact. He was involved in the occult. Even the swastika is a, is a perversion of the Hindu symbol. 
I have a friend of mine who is Hindu, and she told me once after she was married, her and her husband pulled over and had to wipe the soap off the side of their windows because their friends at their Hindu temple had put the uh, symbol of Hinduism, which looks very much like the swastika that Hitler stole from them and, and, and changed it just a tad. But she said, my husband and I, my new husband, and I had to pull over and wipe that off because we said uh, people will think it's a swastika. Hitler was involved in the occult, hidden knowledge. That's what Satan said to Adam and Eve. You'll be like God. You'll have hidden knowledge. How do you find this hidden knowledge? Through occultism, mysticism. What do we see rising today in America and around the world? Occultism, mysticism. And in another program, I can share with you how even the KGB was excited that mysticism and yoga had come to America. Why? So the American people would quit paying attention to what was going on, on the, around the world and only concentrate inwardly and get their chakras in line and make the natural world dissolve and go into the spiritual realm. So we've, we've taken all the steps and put it together to destroy our own country. Paganism is at the root of it, Genesis 3. Absolutely it is. Brand, we've got to in the last portion of this segment now. Let's go into the fourth thought leader, uh, George Hegel. Now, Hegel brought into this, proce into this process a process. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Explain, explain this dialectic. process. Yeah, the Hegelian dialectic process. And this was the fourth thought leader that they followed. He was also from Germany, and he taught the idea of thesis and antithesis, idea, opposite idea. You must get opposites to fight each other. And by doing that, you'll get people to compromise. So you want the right and the left to fight. You want Christians and conservatives to, to be uh, pitted against people who have the very antithesis of a biblical Christian Judeo worldview. Why? because people will get tired of the conflict and they will compromise to have peace and unity. Saul Alinsky, Saul the Red Alinsky, who wrote Rules for Radicals, who was studied by Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama, Saul Alinsky said the change comes from the conflict. So you deliberately pit opposites against each other. People will then compromise to get along, have unity. If you don't compromise, you're called narrow-minded, bigoted, intolerant. And in fact, Herbert Marcuse of the Frankfurt School, who coined the phrase, make love, not war, actually said in a 1965 paper, uh, Repressive Tolerance, that if the uh, folks on the right won't go along with the program, if they keep uh, opposing us, we will deprive them of the right of free speech and the right of assembly. So you're either going to join the group consensus through the conflict or you're going to be punished. And he actually said we'll be more intolerant than the intolerant Christians and conservatives, depriving them of freedom of speech and freedom of assembly. What do you see now? doxing uh, people, bl uh, blackballing people, shadow banning people, banning people on social media and outlets who are conservatives or Christians. Why? Because that's what, exactly what the Frankfurt School said. We have to be more intolerant to them. We cannot tolerate any dissent. But you use the conflict to wear people down so they say, uncle, I give up. And, and Brandon, again, we could, go, we could go much more into depth on that. But ladies and gentlemen, I will share with you personally, I spent 18 years uh, in the legislature in Pennsylvania. I can tell you the political process uses the Hegelian uh, dialectic. And, uh, and actually much of what happens in DC that you're seeing with the way legislation is passed, it's purposely put out that way. You put out something that you never ever expect to get and then you bargain back to where you think you're gonna be. It's all a part of this process. All I'm saying is right now, Brandon, I'm telling him just re re confirming what you're saying, the process is, as you have saying, it has been adopted. It is being used in the process. It's being used on the American people and the mentality of atheism and dethroning God in America is being used and furthered by this process. So ladies and gentlemen, we're gonna cut away here right now. We've talked about and we've developed the first four thought leaders of the process that's being used in America today to dethrone God. And we've established very clearly when you dethrone God and you destroy creation and act of God, then everything as we know it in America falls. People have been after it. We need to understand it. When we come back, we're going to conclude and wrap up this discussion today with how did we get here? If all this happened, is there no one defending? We're going to talk about who that should be, and who must be doing it if we're going to turn this around. Stand in the Gap is produced and recorded in the studios of WBPH Philadelphia, positively different television. To watch archives of this program, go to WBPH.org. 
Welcome back to Stand in the Gap, and we've been talking about uh, our culture and the worldview, like we always do, and looking at how our culture has uh, sought to dethrone God. We've been talking with our, our good friend, uh, Brandon House, and uh, talking about worldview, but talking about, in particular, the Frankfurt School, talking about Marx, Freud, Nietzsche, and Hegel, names that we've all heard, but going into detail of what they have done to bring us to where we are. And uh, we were just looking at some of the processes that they've developed, uh, this idea of this confrontation and battles going on against each other. Uh, as Sam said, that's so popular in the political realm. It's popular in the news. Uh, forcing everybody to come to the group consensus to think together. I know uh, for five years teaching in public schools that that's how they teach us to teach even, is to bring everybody to consensus. I believe that might be one of the reasons why they attack Christian education and homeschooling and things like that, because uh, they can't push everybody into the same mold that they've been doing now for decades. And so we really have been seeing that this is um, insidious. It's, it's like cancer. To me, it, it feels like when my dad had cancer that metastasized throughout his body uh, to the point that it couldn't be fought off, it feels like that's happening in our culture, that uh, this group has started and it has just continued to spread. And uh, it seems that this has happened because they've been very aggressive. And so, Brandon, as we uh, wrap this up, I want to ask you, you know, with, with them being so aggressive, so um, passionate about it, so good at it, really. Uh, what kind of defense has there been, or, or maybe we should say, what kind of defense has not been there? And as we close, what needs to be there to defend our families, our churches, our culture, our nation, our worldview, to take a stand for truth uh, even now? Well, one of the things we must do is to get out information. This is an information operation. This is a propaganda war. So we must get out the information. And that's why I developed the movie, Sabotage the Movie. It's a six-hour docu-movie. And then watch the first hour for free right now. It's sabotagethemovie.com. And this is crucial. People have to have the information in order to know how to fight it. This is largely a brainwashing operation. My next book in docu-movie will be on the fact that this has been a brainwashing operation. One of the keys to brainwashing is don't let people know they're being brainwashed a psychological operation, information operation, propaganda war, fake news, revisionist history. And so you've got to get out the information and show people this is what is happening. This is not conspiracy. Well, it is in one sense, it's a spiritual conspiracy, Ephesians 6, but this is all in their own writings, their own documents. The American people have got to turn off uh, you know, sitcom television and, and silliness and understand they're being ca taken captive. And the Bible tells us not to be taken captive, to destroy the arguments raised up against the principles of the Lord. So one of the main things we have to do is be involved in, a, in opposing the information operation, the brainwashing. I've been studying key military experts from the 50s who could not figure out why our POWs in the Korean War went along with some of the communism without torture or drugs. And one of the key components was they didn't know their history. They didn't know what they believed. They didn't know our form of government. They couldn't defend our way of life, our, our economic, our constitutional republic. And if you can't defend that, you're going to be taken captive. So it's vital what your show does. You're putting out information to destroy arguments raised up against the principles of the Lord and that biblical worldview. And until we do that in our churches, in our homes, in our schools, in Christian media and the alternative media, they will keep winning because the key to brainwashing is never identify the brainwashing technique. People, and, and that's what the guys in the POW camps coming back from the Korean War said, if we had only known. And that's where the code of conduct was developed by the military after this. They begin to make them memorize the code of conduct. Here's what you will do if you're taken prisoner of war. Well, sadly, many Americans have been taken spiritual prisoners of war, and they don't even know it. And it's a great way to close the program. Brandon, thanks for being with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, as we wrap it up, bottom line is, if you do not know the truth, you will fall for a lie. God is the truth. God's word is the truth. Our request of you today, this is just to help whet an appetite, but as the Bereans in Scripture, go and study it out. Study it out. 
but it starts with God, the truth of God, God's Word. All of it is there that we need. You know the truth, you won't fall for the lie. And as we say in the program, this is named for that, stand in the gap for what? For truth. Let us know if you've been watching the program, if you enjoy it, contact us this week. Uh, share with us what your thoughts are. Talk to us about the guests. Let us know what you would like for us to perhaps have on this program. Pray with us financially. Share with us so that we continue to put out the truth.